I hope that most of you, if not all of you, have read the paper um, because that would make everything easier. If you haven't and you want to read it later on and have some questions for the author, I just called him uh, and he said, feel free to email him any questions you may have. OK, so um, mnemonic constitutionalism and the rule of law in Hungary and Russia. OK, in a nutshell, what Ulad, uh, Dr. Belavusau, he was my, my PhD supervisor, what he tries to do in this paper is demonstrate how countries which are paving their way towards illiberalism or authoritarianism, either on the left or on the right, um, uh, because as, as we know, it's not always on the right, even though that's what we hear more of lately. There is left wing populism, there is left wing extremism, uh, there is left wing authoritarianism. So um, what he tries to demonstrate in the paper, and I think he does, um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not the one to judge him, but an excellent job is show just how uh, the route to liberalism, illiberalism, uh, is marked by little pieces of populist crazes, because that's how you get the mass to kind of support all the illegalities you are doing, uh, uh, to the point where you no longer need their support to continue to exist. Uh, so what the countries he has chosen, um, and I know more about Hungary because of the rule of law um, situation, which we will discuss in a minute, more than, more than Russia, um, is that what these countries have tried to do is elevate this idea of the sanctity of memory to the point of constitutional uh, revision, revising constitutions adding uh, pieces of legislations, we'll see the different types of initiatives, in order to construct a particular memory that we need to follow as a nation, right? Um, so this is essentially uh, what is going on. And the way that the, the countries construct that memory is very, very, very beneficial uh, to the uh, leaders and, and also the authors of, of these texts. So an example being with Russia, the victimhood of Russia during the Second World War is evidence, um, but their historical account commences after the occupation of Poland, for example. Okay, so this is in a nutshell what's going on. Memory politics, I mean, are everywhere. They're not only in Central and Eastern Europe. It's simply that at this moment, because we are seeing a, a rise of illiberalism in Central and Eastern uh, Europe, we are seeing this kind of, I think he refers to it as mushrooming of memory laws in that region. But memory laws don't only manifest themselves in, in constitutional texts. So there's a whole campaign in Poland, for example, on changing the names of streets. Uh, we also can see in, in, in our country, uh, in Cyprus, how memory politics are constructed, not only at the level of the legislature, not only at the level of uh, the judiciary, but also at the level of, for example, education. Right. So our slogan for our educational system in Cyprus is then uh, never forget. Uh, I never forget the Turkish invasion. I never forget uh, all, all, all the different things that happened to uh, uh, my country. Right. Now, that doesn't mean that I or anyone arguing against memory laws say that something like the Turkish invasion didn't happen or something like um, the, the Holocaust didn't happen. Don't confuse the two. What we are saying, however, is that when a particular narrative is given, so to make things more local, never forget, in that narrative, who are we never forgetting? We're only never forgetting our own victims. We're only never forgetting our own victimhood. What does that subsequently lead to? 
we do forget the other, right? And our role as perpetrator. So um, there's messages, should I be checking or I should leave them later? Um, ah, okay, right. So um, that's the other thing I just wanted you to get your mind to, that mnemonic developments, either on a constitutional level, as in the countries in the paper, or they can also be on another level, on, 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 a, on, a, on a lower um, a threshold, for example. But that doesn't mean that they aren't um, as effective. And we see that a lot in, in, the, in the functioning of the public educational system in Cyprus. My own personal opinion, by the way, <laughs> um, although I don't think my uh, Danish think tank would mind too much about my opinion on the educational system in Cyprus. Um, okay, so let's get back to the paper. I hope, how do you do this? Do, do, can people interrupt or do we leave it for, for, the rep, for the end if you have questions? Is that easy, I think, yeah? So we don't get confused, yeah. Okay, so this is what this paper is looking at. It's looking at the mushrooming of memory laws in Central and Eastern Europe, and it's very interesting how these memory laws are developed. We'll, we'll look at in some detail uh, later on uh, at some examples. They are very, 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 very simplistic historical narratives of what has happened um, uh, in, in, in the past of these countries. We all know that there's not only one historical uh, narrative, there's not only one historical truth. Um, and the way these laws are developed are overly uh, simplistic, but they're not simply handed over to the people just like that. They come hand in hand with this populist craze. Now, this is very, very important. The more you endow your people with fear, for example, by the way, populism is not uh, a negative term per se. Um, uh, as I'm sure you've already discussed. If not, you'll be discussing it probably tomorrow. Uh, however, in Hungary, populism has, take, has been used for negative things. So when you're kind of hyping people up to vote for people like Viktor Orban, who a few years ago um, got a super majority in the Hungarian parliament and essentially could do anything he wanted with Hungarian law, there has to be a kind of ground, a building of the ground, a fertilization. So how do I do that? I kind of enhance this feeling of um, camaraderie, this feeling of citizenship, this feeling of belonging, this feeling of the nation, um, this feeling of we are in it together. We were the victims of the past. We were the victims of the Nazis. We the Arrow Cross regime, for example, in Hungary, which has also been um, uh, at the European Court of Human Rights in a case regarding a, a symbol um, as, as a theme. Um, anyone interested in that? It's the case of Faber versus Hungary. I'm sure I've pronounced that wrongly. Um, so all that kind of stuff didn't happen. We were the innocent ones and we were the victims. It's a very, very simplistic narrative. And it comes with this idea of the people giving power to the one uh, in, in, in a blind manner, essentially. And what has been going on in, in Central and Eastern Europe uh, for the moment is um, an increase in these kind of initiatives. In Hungary and Russia, we see it on a constitutional level. So amendments to the constitution uh, for purposes of having a particular historical narrative. We'll look at both. In other countries like Poland, we see uh, not at a constitution level, at other lower levels. Now, it's very important, though, to note two things. Um, firstly, this idea of memory laws emanated within the framework of Western Europe uh, after the Second World War. And it was led particularly by countries like Germany and France, okay? But for a very, very, very different purpose. And this is what I want to get across to you. Um, there was a 
excellent, excellent mind and man. And his name was Karl Lowenstein. And he was a German. He was a thinker. He was a Jew. And he realized at some point that he would have to leave Germany or else he would be facing, um, he would be in a bit of trouble. So he did and he uh, emigrated to the US. And when in the US, he wrote, uh, he developed this doctrine of militant democracy, what we call in Greek, mahimi demokratia. So a democracy that fights to protect itself from any actions or speech, so speech can be actions in the mind of, of Lowenstein. Anyone interested on speech and actions, you can read up on the speech act theory. Uh, in my opinion, speech can't be actions, but that's for another summer school. Um, yeah, so he wrote up this idea of militant democracy that in order for a democracy to exist, in order for a democracy to function, we need to put in place fundamental um, barricades to protect it from the uh, enemy. Um, as the propaganda minister of uh, Hitler once said, the biggest joke of democracy, of course, is the fact that it gives the tools to those who want to destroy it to do so. So Lowenstein develops this idea of militant democracy. Um, by the way, because it's only one hour I have to talk, I'm, you know, simplifying this as much as possible. But anyone who wants extra reading on this, just let me know and I can send you stuff over. He develops this idea of militant democracy. So what happens after World War II? Uh, Germany, for example, uh, was like, OK, this never, ever, ever again has to happen. We need to protect ourselves from this. They transpose Lowenstein's idea of a militant democracy in their basic law, in their constitution, and they wrap that up with ideas of historical memory. So what do I mean by that? When it, this is predominantly Germany and France because of their role, not only because of their role in World War II, there were other countries that had a role in World War II, but also because of the fact that they acknowledged that role, either through the Vichy regime or the, the National, Socialist, National Socialist Party itself. After that, they acknowledged the damage and the destruction. And the memory laws established were based on preserving the dignity of the victims of the Holocaust, right? So there was a very different starting point for memory laws in Western Europe uh, after World War II. Okay, now in World in, in, in Western Europe, um, we, we had these memory laws being developed in order to preserve the dignity of, of the Holocaust victims. They were not interrelated with any kind of down thoughting into uh, illiberalism or anything else as we are seeing now. Interestingly, in 2008, um, the European Union itself decided to incorporate um, a provision in a framework decision on racism and xenophobia. So it's the closest we have on an EU level to the prohibition and actually the criminalization of hate speech. Okay. Um, and this framework decision uh, prohibits denying uh, internationally recognized events such as um, the Holocaust. So we also have it as an e on an EU level and not 10 or 15 years after the Holocaust, but in 2008, okay? So this is also a little bit worrying and, I and I'll tell you why. And this is where I'm gonna bring in the, the freedom of expression parts. Um, I think it's interesting for you and interesting in terms of how populists can use expression and abuse it. So there's no denying, and of course I haven't met any of you, but I'm sure none of you will deny that the Holocaust happened. I think it's ridiculous 
even thinking about it. However, how do we have the proof of the existence of the Holocaust? We have it through research, documentation, academics, demonstrating that the Holocaust happened, yeah? Why do we have this proof then? Because we all have the right to free speech. We could go, we could document, we could demonstrate. There was a guy who, his name is Heinz Richter, a German professor in the University of um, Maine. Again, I don't know how to pronounce this very well. Mainheim. Anyway, a university in Germany. Heinz Richter. He was a professor of Greek and Cypriot history. And he was in Crete for quite a while because he was writing a book about the Battle of Crete. OK, and in that book, he essentially said that the Cretan people fought back brutally. Yes, they weren't simply uh, victims when the Nazis came in and slaughtered them, which was the narrative that the Cretan people had had. Yes, they fought back, but they were not brutal. So he writes this book about their brutality and he gets in trouble with the police and he gets uh, a criminal trial. Why? Because the framework decision that I had mentioned a few minutes ago uh, on racism and xenophobia, which does not allow you to revise or deny international, uh, internationally recognized events like the Holocaust, um, had been enacted into the Greek anti-racist law. So Heinz Richter goes to court, huge frenzy outside the court, shouting, swearing uh, about this guy basically saying that he's changing history and he's denying what happened to the people, etc., etc. Thankfully, he was acquitted, right? Um, but you could see how dangerous things can get when memory laws can be constructed by liberal regimes. I'm not mentioning that Greece is an illiberal regime. I'm saying what could happen if it was an illiberal regime and what kind of speech can be silenced, yeah? This is very, very important for you to understand, particularly with a, within a populist framework. So I, as an academic, argue an example that the Armenian genocide is not duly recognized by the European Court of Human Rights. So we have a Swiss case which I rely on and that's my opinion. That doesn't mean that I am denying the Holocaust, but no one can guarantee that if I live in a country which is run by an liberal government, yeah, that I won't be in trouble. So we have to be very, 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 very careful when it comes to memory laws. Who's memory? What is memory? So in Cyprus, that's blatantly obvious because who's memory? The Greek Cypriots, the Turkish Cypriots, the Maronites, who? Who's memory? Who's history? And who is enforcing this law and why? Germany and Poland, uh, sorry, Germany and France. I mean, I don't think that there's any argument against the fact that they really did it because they felt they had to do something at least symbolic for the, 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 the preservation of any dignity that was left uh, to preserve for the victims of the atrocities of the Nazis. Things have changed today. So I hope I've made that kind of distinction clear. Memory laws have not been developed in populist uh, institutions or in populist states. I'm using the term populist again in a negative tone, but it's not always negative. However, in Hungary, uh, Poland, Russia, uh, we are seeing it happening. OK, and this is why it is a little bit worrying that the European Union itself decides to incorporate what we call anti-revisionism law, laws. OK, um, I'm going to go back to this in a minute just to give you a, a bit more factual background. So throughout 2010, um, 
Central and Eastern Europe, uh, not 2010, 2010s, so from 2010 and even still today, um, what we have is a rise in memory laws. So the amendment to the Hungarian constitution, which basically shows Hungary as a great nation and a major victim to World War II. I'll quote exactly what the constitution says in a minute. Um, we have this going hand in hand with a lack and a deterioration of the rule of law, a rise of authoritarianism, a rise of right-wing populism, and a lowering of the power of the people. Yeah? So this is what we're seeing at the moment. So I would say within Central and Eastern Europe, who, uh, countries that belong to the EU, we're seeing this in Hungary and Poland. Beyond the EU, then I would say Russia. Russia has been uh, one of the main agents, let's say, or, or countries uh, promoting this kind of um, mnemonic pro propaganda, particularly in terms of the presentation or representation of um, Stalin. Okay. Now, what happens in Central and Eastern Europe? Hungary does it, Poland does it, Russia does it, and then other states want to do it. Uh, and to follow. And this this kind of gives a very, very weird power, um, interesting power dynamic within the region. Yeah. Um, so it is a little bit um, dangerous. Now, it becomes particularly more dangerous when these laws are criminal laws. And this is where I want to give you the example uh, of the European Court of Human Rights um, to see and compare with what's going on in, in Central and Eastern Europe. So in the European Convention on Human Rights, we have Article 17, the non-destruction clause, which basically says that if you're trying to abuse the rights of the convention, uh, you're, you're just kicked out. You, you can't have your case heard. The legal tests aren't going to be applied. You're not allowed to abuse the rights in the convention. Full stop. In order to do something abusive, something bad. And in all the um, preparatory documents of the convention, Article 17 is time and again demonstrated as the article which was there to prevent the re-rising of totalitarian groups. Okay. And it's been used well, for example, well, not well, but better when there was a group that wanted to reinstate um, a fascist party or the in the right at the beginning of the European court, I think it's a case of 1959, uh, the German Communist Party, they got kicked out by the European Commission, because at that point, it was the European Commission that would hear the case um, based on Article 17. But then something else happened, which is a little bit worrying. We have a selection of cases, mostly against France. Um, I can give you some names and you can look them up. Uh, Bala and Bala uh, versus France, uh, which involved a very uh, controversial comedian in France. We have uh, the case of um, Sulas, that was a, a school teacher, um, that was m mostly on Islam. So we can leave that out for the moment. We have certain cases, however, where we had revisionism. We had people coming and saying, usually against France or Germany, uh, that the Holocaust didn't happen or that the Holocaust did happen, but it wasn't Hitler's doing. Yeah, we have another case which, uh, so W-I-T-Z-S-C-H uh, versus Germany, um, whereby we had this rhetoric again about the Holocaust. Now, in every single case, and I think I have some statistics here which I can share with you, the European Court of Human Rights always found in favour of the country. It never found in favour of the applicant, ever, when it comes to revising uh, the Holocaust. 
The very worrying part is that there's a huge number of cases involving Article 17. Article 17 has never been so heavily used in a group of cases with the same theme as it has been with cases involving revisionism. Now, why is this important and why am I telling you this? In the case of which versus Germany, uh, a guy wrote a letter. Maybe I'll send you the statistics later so I don't interrupt my uh, line of thinking. Uh, a guy wrote a letter to a professor. Uh, a professor had published a piece in a newspaper or whatever about the Holocaust, about the atrocities, etc. And this man uh, decided to send him a private letter, not one that was published in the newspaper or anything else, and said to him, um, I don't agree with you. Uh, Hitler didn't do this. Uh, you're exaggerating. This is a, you know, this crazy propaganda ideas that some people do. Um, but it was a private letter. And the professor took the private letter to the police. And the police went and found a relative of someone who was in the Holocaust and asked, do you want to press charges? And charges were pressed, criminal charges. And the European Court of Human Rights agreed with Germany, even though the letter was private. Right. So do we understand what we mean by the limits of things? The cultivation of memory, the importance of being sure that these memory laws are not ever going to fall in the wrong hands. As in the case of Hungary, I would bet my bottom euro that they have done. Yeah. So why why do I find which particularly worrying is that it was a private letter right so the impact of that letter uh, was that really proportional with a criminal penalty i'm not sure then there's a whole discussion where do you get to if you have a limit speech but we can leave that for another time so that's what goes on at the european court of human rights so in a nutshell the european court of human rights through its case law uh, has used uh, Article 17 mostly for revisionist uh, cases when it comes to speech. Of course, we do have some revisionist cases which Article 10 has been relied on, but the applicant always will lose. On a European Union level, we have the framework decision which prohibits you from arguing that the Holocaust uh, didn't happen. You would be silly to argue that it didn't happen, but Heinz Richter wasn't arguing that it didn't happen. He was simply rephrasing or re reformulating the state of events by showing the brutality of the Cretans. Yeah, his version of of events. He was a historian and that law was used on him. Finally, he was acquitted, but he went through quite a process. So it does become dangerous when you give tools uh, which are relevant to a abstract themes such as memory, uh, history, to states, to judges, to governments, mm, and even more so to a state like Hungary, which is a liberal, and whose judges are the state's friends. Yeah? So to put it very, very simply. On the European level, however, in terms of the European Union and the European Court of Human Rights, we or they are in full agreement. If you deny the Holocaust, uh, or you try and say that m maybe not as many Jews were killed, or maybe Hitler wasn't responsible, you can be, or you should be, your state should punish you criminally. That's the state that we have. Um, again, though, that is not inbuilt in some kinds of populist propaganda. Uh, or doesn't accompany an illiberal um, uh, leader to the top. It's not a way to romanticize their history. Yeah, because there's not, you know, it's different countries with some shared history. But that I think it's important to understand that this whole idea of memory laws did start from Western Europe. It subsequently was 
uh, incorporated into European institutions, but has now been altered uh, within the framework of populism. OK, <clears throat> now. What this paper tries to argue, this idea of mnemonic uh, constitutionalism, what uh, Dr. Balabusar tries to argue is that the populist politics of memory, because there's a lot of politics of memory, it's very nice to feel that you remember the same thing as somebody else, because then you also belong to the same thing as somebody else. And that element of identity and belonging, particularly <coughs> in new states or newer states or states which are still transitioning, must never be undermined. OK, so what he tries to argue is that the populist politics of memory has articulated itself in what he calls mnemonic constitutionalism and that is the elevation essentially of the legal go governance of historical memory to a constitutional level so we're not just talking about the books at school which still by the way anyone who says that they don't write then xechno they still write then xechno i have a few of them here um it's it elevates itself from that level. It elevates its level to the constitution. Now, some of you may be thinking, what is this woman chatting about? There have been so many things going on in Russia. Putin has tried to extend his power to go on and on and on and on and on. Why is she going on about this? What can be the harm in a small provision on history? Well, memory politics, is a very strong fist for the wrong type of populism for the reasons i explained before identity belonging nationhood i i surrender myself to my nationhood i live for my nationhood i live so that things don't happen again to that nation uh, so on a constitutional level we only see two countries having done things within the framework of memory laws uh, that being uh, Hungary and Russia. And within uh, the span of about 10 years, we have we have had different kinds of uh, changes. OK, now mnemonic constitutional in this regards essentially places the authority and the legitimacy of a state into the boundaries of a certain historical paradigm. Yeah. So. We are Hungary, we were the victims of the Nazis, we did nothing wrong, the Arrow Cross regime never existed, we never took the Jews to the Danube to ship them off, none of that ever happened, we were victims. And we are proud that we have maintained our nation. Now, mnemonic constitution essentially li limits uh, or, or, or grants the legitimacy of the state into this historical paradigm, so the state can never move away from that, yeah? Whereas current and future attitudes and behaviors must derive by moral lessons from the past, okay? So that's a very, a very basic theoretical foundation of uh, um, the constitutionalism that he argues. I think here it would be interesting, actually, uh, and it's also a little bit of a twist to tell you a little bit about the case of Faber versus Hungary. There was a man. No, I won't start with him. And when I say men is because I've also seen that the majority of uh, Article 10 free speech cases are being brought in by men. We'll have to see why maybe in another research project we can do together now. Um, so there was an anti-racist um, demonstration in Budapest uh, with lots of people. Um, if, you know, it was a peaceful assembly, however, but it was a big demonstration. And there was a man who went and stood just opposite them on the other side of the bank of the river. Uh, and he, hold, he held a big uh, arrow cross regime. If you, if you Google it, you can see it. It's the... Um, 
the Arrow Cross regime was essentially the, the, the far right um, grouping of Hungary during uh, the, that time with, you know, links and affiliations to uh, the Nazi party. So the police came and said, what are you doing? You're just going to cause trouble. He wasn't speaking. He wasn't shouting slogans. He was doing nothing. OK, um, and he got into trouble with the police. And he went to the European Court of Human Rights and he said, I did nothing. I went there and I held the Arrow Cross flag. I didn't swear at them. I didn't shout at them. I wasn't violent to them. And I was alone. It was me and all those people. So the European Court of Human Rights, in the only case which, has it which it decided in favor of an applicant when anything has to do with the Second World War, apart from another case, which is not really, it's a little bit different. It's a case against France and a, uh, a particular figure in, in the French army. So I wouldn't put that in the same group. Um, the European Court of Human Rights said, yeah, OK, that flag is not good. And maybe they got upset, but they've had many, many years to get over it. And they shouldn't be upset. And restricting your freedom of expression is disproportionate to people getting upset, right? OK, nice, nice interpretation. You know, that living instrument of the ECHR, we see it in the Faber versus Hungary regime. And then we get another case where the case of, I, I'm not going to be able to pronounce this, but Vajnai versus Hungary, where we had, uh, um, he had a particular position in, in the Communist Party of Hungary and they went to the square in Budapest where the um, Karl Marx statue had been thrown down and he was wearing a hat with um, the communist symbol on. Uh, so he got into trouble with the police and he went to the European Court of Human Rights. And why, why did both Faber and Van Ay get into trouble? because of this co um, construction of memory. If you don't fit into that particular construction of memory, uh, then you're going to get in trouble. So let me just have some water. OK, so he goes to European Court of Human Rights and he said, I'm sorry, this is a symbol of communism, but it's also the symbol of international workers' movements, etc." So the European Court of Human Rights turned around and said, yeah, it is the symbol of the international workers' movement, but even if it is a symbol of communism, so what? Uh, people have had enough time to get over communism, despite the fact that the victims of communism, if you count them uh, just in the region, are huge, if not huger. Yeah, but I don't like this game of oh, how many here and how many there. An atrocity is an atrocity. And that's the end of that. Dignity is dignity, and that that's the end of that. However, the ECHR did not uh, adapt this this uh, thinking, and they said, "Yep, people have had time to get over the atrocities. Just because your hat may have offended some relatives of people who had been killed by 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 this regime, is not enough to silence you." Yeah. So memory there should play no um, uh, role. OK, and these were all the cases at the, the beginning of the 2000s before the development of the Constitution. Yeah, there was still, you know, some kind of memory law here and there. And then we come to 2016 to the case of Nix, NIX versus Germany. And this is the last ECHR case that I'm going to give you just so you can make the difference. So Nix versus Germany there was a man who had a blog and he wrote different opinions and anything to do with social issues, politics and a well-informed blog. It wasn't, you know, an, anything else. And his daughter was in high school and she was being prompted by the labor office um, to go on vocational, vocational training, i.e. not to go to university in a, in a brief nutshell. She was half German, half Nepalese. OK, so he was and on social benefits, him at her and her father. And he was trying to prove essentially how his child was wrong done by um, uh, 
the labor office. And at that time in Germany, there was a whole discussion by lots of parents how their children were prompted by uh, the labor offices in different regions to join certain professions, obviously because there was a lack of um, labor, labor work. So he wrote a blog piece, five blog pieces, and on one blog piece, he put an image of a Nazi, I don't remember who, uh, with the Nazi uniform. Uh, and then he wrote something like, this is what they're trying to do, just like there was this militarization, they're trying to militarize our children into certain labors, etc. Yeah? So uh, the European Court of Human Rights said, yep, Germany is right to make you pay a penalty uh, because Germany has had such a horrific uh, past with the Nazis. It did not contextualize the manner in which this father had used the image of the Nazi. Yeah. He wasn't using it as Faber used the um, arrow flag, the arrow cross flag, for example. He wasn't using it because he believed in anything that the Nazis believed in. He used it as an allusion to this kind of authoritarian uh, regime. But he got in trouble, yeah? Even at the ECHR level, they agreed with him getting into trouble. Okay, so... Um, that's it on the ECHR level. I think that helps us really understand how we go about memory. And we always look at memory within the framework of Article 10, the freedom of expression under the European Convention on Human Rights. And with anything to do with the Holocaust and with Nazism, we always, always agree with the state, even in the case of Nix. OK, so. Um, Ah, this is also interesting, moving away uh, from what goes on on, a, on an EU and Council of Europe level, looking particularly uh, at the central, at the, at Central and Eastern Europe. So what kind of memory politics, what kind of measures for memory politics have been developed over the past 10 years? So we've had constitutional provisions which prescribe certain understandings of the past and distributing guilt for past atrocities. So the classic example here is the, the rhetoric in constitutions, which has started in it for the Russian constitution from 1941 and not from 1939. Why? So as to conveniently avoid the occupation of Poland, number one. Um, punitive measures of memory governance, i.e. imposing criminal responsibility for the denial of Nazi or communist crimes, or prescribing the correct attribution of atrocities to a singular perpetrator. And this is what happened in Greece in the case of Heinz Richter. Because the rhetoric, also at a state level, with the Battle of Crete, which was a very, very in famous or infamous battle, uh, the, per the perpetrator was one. He came and revised that. He got in trouble. But thankfully, he was acquitted. And he had one hell of a lawyer and a lot of uh, academics uh, supporting uh, the case. And not only legal academics, I mean, but also histori historians. We also have non punitive measures of memory governance. For example, renaming of streets, um, the place of uh, historical mo monuments. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you remember uh, here when the, the airport in Larnaca was renamed Glavkos Gliridis, who was our former president. Yeah. Some people agree with what Glavkos Gliridis did and said. Some people don't agree with what Glavkos Gliridis didn't say, didn't say. Some people attribute to Glavkos Gliridis certain, uh, I wouldn't say responsibilities as such, but a, a key role in what goes on and what has happened in Cyprus. Some people give him a good um, a role. Some people give him a bad role. Uh, 
I will tell you what I give him. Now, uh, but the, the airport was renamed, uh, you know, with his name. So there was a lot of complaining about that. Uh, but that is a non-punitive measure of memory governance, because if I have, if I've got two airports, two free airports in my tiny little island, and one of them has the name of a previous politician, then there's definitely uh, an effort to kind of govern my memory, because you're not going to put the name of someone bad on uh, the airport, yeah? Again, we see, however, the absolute authority that the state has on that. His name would never have been placed on the airport under another uh, government, for example, for obvious reasons. Um, but this thing with the street names, um, we we are seeing in Poland. OK, so in Poland, there isn't this constitutional change that, as there has been in Hungary and Russia. But we are seeing the names of, uh, of streets. And there's some good blog pieces that I think Uland has quoted that you can have a look at. Quasi, quasi memory laws, i citizenship laws that permit naturalization based on historical belonging. We see this in Israel a lot. The uh, Jew coming back to his sacred land after so many years and we need to um, indulge in, in, in citizenship. So we do see that. And then we see judgments of national tribunals relating to the legitimate remembrance of the past. So again, for example, the case of um, Heinz Richter. Now, strictly speaking, only the first, i.e. the constitutional provisions, the constitutional revisions um, are part of this um, governance of memory that is constitutional, yeah? However, all the elements I've, I've um, mentioned relate to uh, memory uh, policies and mnemonic constitutionalism. Yeah, so it's very important to see how these groups function, but also to note that all the five groups that I've mentioned have been applied to secure a political, politically preferable vision of the past. Yeah, and a prescription of an ontological ontological foundation of the future. So these memory laws are dictating what happens and are di dictating what will happen and how one must behave and how the state should behave. And here I want to just open a parenthesis. It's not strange for a country, uh, even a liberal uh, democracy, to have in its constitution a reference to its past, particular when it's it wants to disassociate from colonial ties, particularly in cases where trustees have happened and there's a, a new state that it's been reborn. It's not at all strange for that to happen. We see that. Um, the difference is when this happens at a later point in the existence of the state and for purposes of this kind of construction of a group memory. And anyone who does not fit into that group memory or anyone who does not adhere to the group memory and anyone who, who does not agree with having a particular memory imposed or anyone who would argue, well, I'm sorry, but Russia did this or Hungary did that, would have criminal uh, liability, uh, is ousted from the group because the populist government, as we see it today, is always see, seeking to create a very strongly knitted, strongly tied, homogenous group. Why? Because that is much easier to control. Plurality is not as easy, particularly when we have a plurality of ideas, okay? So I hope I'm, I hope I'm clear there. So now I'm, I've only got 10 minutes. I want to give you a few uh, examples, uh, more particular examples from Hungary. So Hungary is a very interesting case. I'm sure you all know about the deterioration of the rule of law, uh, about the EU 
being very, very slow with what it has to do with Hungary and Article 7 of the Treaty on, on European Union. Uh, Hungary is still a member of the European Union, and in my opinion, it should always be a member of the European Union. European Union, despite the rule of law backsliding. And I'll tell you why, and this is relevant to the discussion. There's a lot of complaining, um, and it's very reasonable. There's a lot of complaining about how Article 7 of the Treaty on European Union, which essentially suspends the voting rights of EU countries, um, is, is a problem. Uh, that it, it's not being properly used, that Hungary should have been kicked out ages ago, and Poland, and blah, blah, blah. OK, if we kick Hungary out of the European Union, firstly, who, who are we to do that? And secondly, what happens to the Hungarian people and particularly the people who are not fitting in the group that is not the other? The Roma, the LGBT person, the single mother, the mother who doesn't want to have children, um, a person who doesn't associate with any gender, the immigrants. Yeah. What happens to the people that Orban is targeting if they're if the EU is out? Yeah, at least there is a benchmark. Most people in most institutions across the European Union would say that I'm talking wrongly, but I do think it's important to start thinking the other way around as well. There's other ways we can cut funding for European projects. We can prevent other kinds of activities, but stopping, suspending voting rights, which essentially makes you a dead country, is quite very extreme. And sometimes we have to remember that the country isn't the government, it's it's the people, yeah? So we just need to wake the people up again not to be voting uh, so much for these kind of governments, I think. So after the victory of Fidesz, so Fidesz is uh, the party of Viktor Orban, Fidesz belongs to the biggest uh, political family in Europe, hence they've been having it quite easy. Now, after the victory of Fidesz, so I call it, well, most people call it Fidesz too, in the 2010 elections, the government for the first time received a super parliamentary majority. Yeah? So we always see whether that's Greece, whether that's Hungary, Croatia, Romania, Lithuania, we always see um, a rise in more authoritarian politics uh, when at a time of financial crisis. But we don't use financial crisis as an excuse for bad things, we just recognize it. Okay, so after 2010 elections, Fidesz really got powerful in Hungary, and the preamble of the new Hungarian fu fundamental law of 2010 is very, very, very unique. Okay, uh, very, very unique. And it goes into much historical Death. Okay, so I'm going to refer exactly as it says. It starts with a national avowal, which refers to the King Saint Stephen. I, as founder of the Hungarian state, proclaims Christianity as historically center, central in the preservation of the nationhood. And most importantly, it reinforces Hungarian victimhood as a divided nation in the 20th century. Yeah, uh, it praises the Hungarian state. It condemns uh, Hungarians, Nazis, and communist foreign occupation. It claims uh, that it was uh, a complete victim. It really, really, really places Hungary in a role of victimhood, uh, which tried to battle for its nation. Um, uh, and is finally free. Okay, uh, and this happened not after the Second World War, this happened uh, in the last few years, right, and with the rise of populism. Um, so it's very, very important to understand that. Now, why, you may tell me, are you spending time on history? Uh, and it's not me, it's this Hungarian uh, academic uh, who said, the Constitution, the one I just read you, the part of the reference to history, failed to acknowledge that war crimes and crimes against humanity were committed not only by foreign occupying forces, but also between 1920 and 1944 by extreme right-wing free 
troops and the security forces of the independent Hungarian state. Okay? And not only against foreigners, but also against its people. So it's a recultivation of Hungarian history. Yeah? Uh, and just a couple of words on Russia be before I make a conclusion. On 11th of March, the lower chamber of the Russian parliament adopted the third and final readings of the amendments to the constitution. They were approved by the Federation Council essentially on the same day. And one of the amendments stipulates a new and novel provision, namely that the Russian Federation honors the memory of defenders of the fatherland and protects historical truth, diminishing the significance of the people's heroism in defending the fatherland is not permitted. OK, and in addition to that, it has created even before that in 2015 memory laws, including a five year prison sentence for inter alia denying facts related to the Red Army's actions during the war. OK, so very, very quickly. Uh, also, actually, as well as the Red Army's actions during the war, or this five year uh, prison term can be given for desecration of the symbols of military glory. And the latter plays a particular role in the memory wars with Ukraine during the recent conflicts over Crimea uh, and Donbass. OK, so to sum up, because I've got three minutes. Memory, abstract, history, abstract, Second World War, what happened? Absolute atrocities, the Holocaust, extermination of people, the degradation of humanity. Germany and France and the ECHR and very, very much later on the EU wanted these memory laws in order to preserve the dignity of, 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 um, of the victims of the Holocaust. Yeah, doesn't make them right because. But there was no bad intention. There's a lot of free speech aspects that are not for today. But what I'm trying to tell you is that those laws were not they did not emanate from anything bad, authoritarianism, or um, you're trying to go on the road of illiberalism, yeah? It was because of the atrocity. In the Central and Eastern Europe region now, for the past 10 years, we have seen a rise in these measures. Hungary and um, Russia, constitutional changes, yeah? So it's actually in the constitution. And then we have in other countries, Poland, for example, other measures, renaming of, of, of streets, criminal laws, which are anyway with the blessings of the European Union, because that's what the EU wants us to do. Um, and we can see how these things can go wrong when the deciders of the laws are themselves illiberal. Yeah. And it's always important to bear in mind when you are reading, when you are researching, when you are writing, when you are working on the theme of populism, never to forget the um, populism as we have it today in Europe, huh? because Populism can be a good thing, uh, as we have it today. The importance of identity, the importance of nationhood, and the importance of belonging. That is how you're going to keep the people with you, to blind them from the fact that actually your courts are no longer just. Okay, so you may say, okay, the Russian constitution, the amendments are so, so, there's such more significant aspects. But I would argue, no, history, memory and belonging are also very significant, not only for the rise of someone like Viktor Orban, but also for the preservation of his government. And that's it. So now, any questions, please um, uh, remember that this is not my paper. And if you have any particular uh, questions on the paper, Ulad, I uh, would be very pleased to hear from you. So any comments, anything you want to say? You're doing it in comments. OK, so Christina. Thank you. Uh, so Natalie, okay. uh, yeah. thank you very much for uh, this very, very fascinating discussion. Uh, so now I would invite people both here 
uh, in Cyprus and on the chat to write their questions. Uh, Natalie, um, if you want to take the questions in the chat as they come, that's absolutely fine. It's not a question, it's a comment. Yeah, this one is not a question, it's a comment. Yes. Uh, okay, so uh, do we have any questions for Natalie here? Uh, so, Natalie, I have a question for you, but I was a little bit disappointed at your later comment that you didn't want to talk a lot about freedom of expression. Uh, do you want to ask? I don't have to. <laughs> no, 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 I do appreciate that. So, um, when you talked about all those uh, cases uh, in the European Court of Human Rights, um, those cases invariably raise questions of freedom of expression. Yep. So they do have freedom of expression against some other value or principle that might be um, uh, uh, hatred for others, racism or whatever. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And you seem to suggest that uh, the mistake of the European Court of Human Rights was that it didn't afford freedom of expression um, uh, enough uh, weight, essentially. Mm -hmm. is, is that right? Yeah. yeah. Yes. So my question is, what would be the philosophical foundation for free speech having priority? Because I, I, I myself agree with your position, right? Uh, but uh, I, I would like to know what you think the philosophical foundation of this freedom of expression is. And uh, one possibility from, from your uh, lecture was uh, dignity, because uh, dignity is something that you mentioned multiple times. And I was wondering if this is what you consider to be the foundation of, for the priority of free speech, or if you uh, trace the priority of free speech in some other value or principle, or whatever, or whatever that might be. Yeah. Okay, do I take question by question? Um, but I think we could do that, and if we have more questions, then we'll see how, how we can uh take it from there yeah yeah okay so yeah um what's your name who just asked me the question uh it's me it's andreas ah it's you i don't know it's you. okay all right andrea nice to meet you um so my point uh in terms of free speech to put it you know just in a couple of lines is that it's a trump card for everything else that comes up. So over the past 10 or 15 years, we're talking about oh, all this hate speech, yeah? So as soon as the European Court of Human Rights sees hate speech, cases out of the window. There is no analysis of the speech itself. There is no conceptualization or contextualization of that speech. There is no, and I don't really need a real theoretical backdrop more than the Universal Declaration gives me, more than the International Bill of Rights gives me, more than the travel, the preparatory documents of the ECHR give me, that the freedom of expression is fundamental. We live in a democracy. We do not live in a direct democracy. That means that freedom of expression, freedom of speech is so fundamental because we have seen time and again, look at South Africa and its history, look at how minorities have been silenced, yeah? In any kind of colonies, how, my, how, how free speech was used supposedly for the promotion of rights and the promotion of dignity, but actually to silence a minority, yeah? I don't believe that a liberal democracy can function without freedom of expression for the very, very, very basic reason that who, whose speech are we choosing? Yeah, do you see what I mean? And at the very bottom of that, you are right. My argumentation is the concept of dig dignity, is the doctrine of dignity, everyone's dignity to be able to express themselves. In Handyside versus the UK, you all know that the European Court of Human Rights said that ideas should Ideas and speech should extend to those which shock, offend, or disturb. Yeah? Sometimes in my lectures, people don't like what I say. I'm not saying it out of malice. I'm not saying it to make anyone feel awkward. It's my belief. Yeah? And another colleague may say something that I find completely ridiculous or even offensive. But if we do not have this freedom, 
right, uh, to do so, then there is no di dialogue within society. And this detracts from our very own dignity. And I just want to add something to this, Andrea, because I'm answering it very, very quickly, but I hope I'm getting it across. If anyone wants to look at how freedom of expression is balanced in such a beautiful way, uh, look at the South African Constitutional Court, uh, which bases its theoretical and normative foundation on George Orwell in deciding that offensive speech should be allowed and free speech should not be restricted. Because we also have the other extreme, which is the US absolutist approach to freedom of expression. I think that's very difficult in a region like Europe. But yes, at the end of the day, it is because of dignity and it is because we don't have a direct democracy. And whose speech is it? And to note here, I think it's very important, we're on um, social media, we're, on, we're in a dig digital world, yeah? Germany has passed the Network Enforcement Act, which essentially forces IT companies to remove hate speech or what they perceive as hate speech within 24 hours. Speech is going down the drain. We need to reimagine the foundation set up, I don't know, even by Voltaire, by, by Mills, by, by the Greek thinkers, yeah? Because it's being completely deteriorated. Because what has happened from day one is because the European institutions were born out of the ashes of the Holocaust, there has always been a balancing act. There doesn't have to be one. Yeah, and look at the South African Constitutional Court for that. Okay, that is that okay? There's more questions here. Uh, dear Natalie, I want to say thank you for such an interesting. Okay, this is a comment. Thank you, Christina. Olga, hello. Thank you. Uh, how do I scroll down? Okay. Hello, Natalie. Thank you for the lecture. How you take the notion of memory laws in international law when we see the clauses still existing in the UN Charter mentioning uh, enemy nations. Uh, what do you mean? How do I take the notion of memory laws? How I perceive it on an international level? I mean, to make it simple, memory laws should not exist in a nutshell, whether that's on an international level, whether that's on a European level, whether that's on a national level. That's my positioning. But my positioning is also emanating from this fundamentality of freedom of expression. It's like that model, what's her name? Gigi Hadid. She puts a picture of her Palestinian passport on Instagram and they took it down and then they reinstated it. Uh, after she complained, and also she's Gigi Hadid, so when she's going to make a complaint, people are going to listen. Yeah, so any other questions or comments? Would you please clarify if there were or there are some imbalances in practice when the protection of memory law, for example, or other rights to lead to a breach of freedom of discussion? Yeah, of course. Um, I thank you, Olga. Uh, nice to hear from you again. Um, when you have a memory law, you are uh, breaching uh, public discourse. Uh, and uh, this is because memory law essentially uh, stops your uh, discussion. It stops your speech. And the best case to, to look at, which is close to us, is the case of Heinz Richter. By imposing the memory law on him, he was at risk of going to jail for the book he wrote, which was for purposes of a public historical discussion. I think that's it with questions. Uh, OK, let's see if we have any other questions here. Uh, Stefan, you wanted to say something? Yeah, if no one else wants to. Sorry? I'm coming. <laughs> Olga, okay, thanks. Okay, hi, Natalie. Hi. It's nice to see you. Uh, I think it's a little further towards me. Uh, yes, right. Can you see? Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Okay, thanks a lot for this uh, visual way. Very excited, very little, uh, very. Uh, very committed to what you're discussing, which is what I love about you. I have a few questions for you and for everyone else. 
So I took some notes and there were some aspects which I thought were very interesting. I don't know last paper, or in a way you developed it and you interpreted it. Uh, in particular, I was thinking to try to link what you were saying to what to the previous presentation we had. It was Katerina and she was talking about EU citizenship. Now I was thinking whether, because Natalie is also an expert in uh, EU law, whether EU citizenship could play a role at uh, the EU level to try to address EU collective memory. Can we think of a way that EU citizenship could, could help to actually create and enhance and exercise collectively European memory? What do you think, Nancy? What do I think? Yes. Uh, I think it sounds very good. I think there's a template already in Israel, um, which is a discussion that could be looked at. Um, it sounds like a huge project, uh, but why not? I mean, in what way do you see it contributing to it, to the collective memory, by another way of bringing people together? Or? But one way to find probably uh, populist trends uh, embedded into memory law uh, perhaps would be to build or invest more in our collective history, our European collective history. So, so try to uh, have a stronger European identity than what we have currently. And this is something we've been discussing, of course, in the previous uh, discussion as well in the previous workshop we were discussing you know uh, moving to uh, the European level so I think perhaps that could help and I have a feeling that this is missing from the discussions uh, we were having and from what you're saying I have a feeling that uh, European collective history is not something that is uh, nurtured that is uh, that is cultivated enough What's the difference between, you know, uh, uh, especially with respect to the Second World War, there should be, you know, obvious links between the history of all the countries that were involved in the Second World War. Why don't we tease those out to, you know, to, to, to counterbalance memory loss? It's an idea. And then I have a question on China. Uh, has anyone done any research on memory loss in China? So, as an example of uh, an authoritative regime, regime, do we have any any such uh, research? Natalie, are you aware of that? The only research in, in Asia uh, that I'm aware of is uh, Japan and Korea. Um, but I read or seen nothing on China, and that would be very, very, very interesting, especially now with the treatment of Muslims in China. That would be particularly interesting to see. Yeah, please, George, uh, get closer. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Hi. Good to see you. Um, about China, was this article I was reading uh, last week sometime on a, on a historian who was actually uh, in prison for a couple of years and he insisted on undertaking research on, on, on China and history and the uh, Mao's revolution and so on. And now he's uh, very, very well known. He's a historian, that's why I don't remember the name. Um, but it was an autobiographical essay and it was very interesting because he was recognized in the West and now he's a recognized professor in Shanghai, I think. Um, so obviously, being a, the regime there is in, in China, it's it's, uh, it's tricky, or it takes a while at least to have your work recognized. But he was exactly insisting that the, the history he was researching had to be uh, had to be looked into, and he was explaining how much trouble he got to find archives, access archives find our kind of our material. Uh, he, he and his wife were a part of a private division team uh, to establish an archive from the historical period he was looking into. It was a very interesting uh, 
Okay. You can uh, share it in the chat. Yes. 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 And Natalie Yan will be good if you would share, share in the chat a few of the sources you referred to. Yeah. That would be useful. Now, I also, when I was listening to you and I was uh, listening to you know, changes of names of streets, for example, that reminded me of two things. First of all, in my area, suddenly, you know, the, the street changed name and uh, it became, I won't say woman's name, but it became, uh, you know, the avenue of the guy who basically donated some land in the area. And I found this so upsetting. So it, it's something which is indeed very upsetting. But more seriously, um, you may not know, but during the French Revolution, uh, during the period that is referred to as la terreur, the terror, there was a change in the calendar. So uh, the revolutionists uh, adopted a new calendar. It's called the revolutionary calendar or the republican calendar. So they changed everything. They, they changed the names of the, of the days, they changed the names of the months. So that, that's an interesting um, parallel. And I don't know whether there has been work on memory laws in the past. So maybe historical memory loss, is there such a thing? Or is, is this a more contemporary research area? Andrea's supervisor would be the best to answer that. Yeah, I think Eric uh, has worked on yes. uh, historical memory loss. Wow. Yeah, that's great. You yes. mean historical memory loss? Okay, great. Yes. So he's the one we need to invite. <laughs> Next time we will. Yes. Okay, uh, Do we have uh, any more questions for Natalie? Go ahead. Okay, thank you. In Andrew, I heard you speaking a lot uh, in the last few years. As memory. I still find it very, very difficult to find the boundary, though, between... Uh, because I, I deal with the other side of history and memory. The history and memory that nobody ever talks about anymore. Yeah. And I think that's as damaging. Yeah. So, um, how do you balance the two? I mean, you have on the one side populist regimes that emphasize what they what they like, what they want, and then you have another other cases around the world where uh, parts of history are completely suppressed. Yeah. So uh, I was wondering what's the connection if there is any because it's still memory law. I mean mm -hmm. memory laws to a certain extent. The answer to that is, is freedom of expression. <laughs> If you facilitate expression, I can hear my voice. Shall I mute? Okay. If you facilitate freedom of expression as an inherent notion of the constitution, the law, and the functioning of society, and not have memory laws as such which prohibit what you say, then what is done within the framework of, let's say, truth and reconciliation always will rest on the basis of truth and uh, of freedom of expression. That's why I mentioned the South African Constitutional Court. Because at 36 years old, I found the court which actually properly looks at how to deal with speech that can be problematic. And I think it's by no coincidence that that came from a country like South Africa. OK, especially because laws, hate speech laws, for example, had been used during colonial times to silence the minorities and subsequently the way they dealt with memory was through truth and reconciliation and now the way their constitutional courts deals with any kind of speech case is with a very 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 proactive and protective framework of freedom of expression so i think that would be interesting to look at nasia um nadia Moon. And I don't think that it's always balancing. I think Andreas also asked me before, you, it's usually about balancing this and about balancing that. There are some elements in the functioning of, of a liberal democracy that are so fundamental that they just stop at that. Unless, of course, I'm calling for violence and there's an immediate risk and whatever else. Yeah? Uh, um, Natalie, since we mentioned Derek, um, I was wondering, um, because one of the things that uh, Eric does 
when he talks about hate speech bans, is he distinguishes between different democracies. And when he speaks about hate speech bans, he talks about what he calls long-standing, stable and prosperous democracies, i.e. democracies that have a tradition of democracy, uh, that have the resources to protect individual rights and so forth. Uh, so I was wondering if a, a similar distinction could be made in the, in, in, uh, in the way you talk about memory loss. So maybe we can say that whatever you've said so far against memory loss is absolutely true and correct when it comes to stable democracies, uh, but maybe we could take a step back and reconsider our approach when we speak of lesser democracies. I was wondering what you think about that. So you mean to do what? To allow memory laws in stable democracies, but not in less stable democracies? Um, for, for, well, the, the, the other way around, maybe. So, right. so, so the argument would be that uh, in, a, in a stable democracy uh, that respects freedom of speech, right? it would be illegitimate to have limits on what people could say. But let me stop you right there. You've made a hypothesis that I don't really know can be supported. Just because I have a stable democracy doesn't mean I have a respect to freedom of expression. Germany is a stable democracy. No one can doubt that. Yet the way freedom of expression as one of the threats to democracy through the framework of militant democracy is developed, and as we see in cases like which versus Germany, I wouldn't call Germany, despite it being a democracy, a stable one, a country which properly adheres to the freedom of expression. Hence the Network Enforcement Act, which forces content moderators, yeah, working on $6 a day to take down your speech from Facebook within 24 hours at risk of a 50 million euro penalty. So I think we can't assume certain things, yeah? And at the same time, we can't assume that in a less stable democracy, a memory law will do anything good. I'd be very worried. I'm very worried with what goes in Hungary, uh, what goes in Hungary, goes on in Hungary, sorry. These memory laws are as a result of that rise of authoritarianism, if you see what I mean. Yeah, no, 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 that, that's absolutely clear. clear. What I wanted to, to see is whether, uh, that's more about speech in general, more so than about memory loss, uh, but whether this limits or non-limits when it comes to speech are dependent on the background conditions of the democratic regime in place. That's kind of the point that I want to tease out. Yeah, no, it's an interesting point. And Eric does make the hierarchy, but also at the same time, Eric is quite adamant about restriction. So because there are so many other factors beyond whether something's democratic or not. Also, uh, absolutely, and the reason why he's able to make those bold statements is because he has made certain um, uh, preconditions being met in his background conditions of the state in place. Yeah, and I think here for the participants, it's very important to note something else that Eric does, which I think has contributed to his findings, is actually seeing the impact of restricting speech. What happens when you silence people? What is going to happen on the 7th of October if the Greek court finds that Golden Dawn is a criminal organization and all those MPs go to jail? I'm scared, yeah? Because all their followers need to find another home, number one. Number two, there's this Danish academic or Finnish, I think Danish, he did an extensive empirical analysis of what happens in countries, liberal democracies, which have hate speech laws. Right? What happens? He was showing a correlation with people going to more violent, real life violence, yeah? Because they did not have that space to just give off their steam, yeah? It's, his name is Randland, I can send you that. So there's a lot of, 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 of issues, empirical, contextual, um, that, that need to be taken into account. At the end of the day, however, I still stick to my guns that if you do give freedom of expression to all, you facilitate not only the voice of the mi minority, you take the power from the hands of the state and you also do something else. You allow counter narratives. Okay.
Uh, thank you, Natalie. Thank you very much for your talk. I don't know if we ha have any other questions or we can proceed to. Have you have a couple of questions. Yeah, please go ahead. Okay, thank you. So as a follow up to what you were discussing now, um, is there any reason why we should not have the same thought of future project, perhaps something along the line of the, uh, the link between culture and memory loss. How do cultures um, interpret specific events? I'm thinking about uh, uh, phenomena that are, that are landmarks of a specific culture. Uh, death penalty, slavery, segregation, revolutions, invasions and so on so that could be also a way to to perhaps uh, give some sort of positive role to memory loss to go back to what we we're discussing before depending on the level of democracy because you said Natalie that uh, there should be no memory loss that is very much dependent on the culture uh, and that is very much dependent on how specific milestones in a country's history or a space history uh, are being perceived. Do you want to comment on this? Yeah, I say that there should be no memory laws because I I'm not a memory lawyer, but because I I agree with the memory experts, whether that's Heinz, whether that's Ulad, whether that, you know, everyone who was on this huge project and did a full contextual and theoretical analysis of the impact of memory laws. In a democracy and in a cultured, let, if we want to use the term cultured uh, place, memory laws will do one thing. They will silence people from speaking, OK? And they will limit freedom of expression. In a country like Hungary, where there is an authoritarian state, the memory law is drawn by that authoritarian state for its own self-promotion. So I don't really see the use of putting someone in jail for denying the Holocaust. I don't see the, the use of giving someone a fine because he argued that uh, the Christians fought back to the Nazis. I look at the day after. And I also look at the very, very, very fundamental nature of speech. So in my opinion, I don't see the impact, right? Memory is constructed. Memory is a group memory, but in our cultures, in our societies, we have a multitude of memories. When we are creating, I'll give you the other example, the then Xechno, never forget. In our minds, we're thinking of Greek Cypriots, but this, the victims to the, the invasion were not only Greek Cypriots. So I do find it very, very difficult ever to agree with a restriction to freedom of expression because I've seen not in terms of memory, in, in terms of hate speech, the, the, the effect of that, but also in terms of memory, what really would be the point? There are so many other ways in order to bring our societies together to speak about the truth. There are so many other ways to reconcile the people. Is the only way we have to take away the most fundamental, one of the most fundamental of our rights? But if you if you tell this to someone like Alexander Tsessis or or Waldron or or anyone else, he'll think I'm completely mad, right? So it's the way you perceive expression in society, I think. But I would be very scared if we in Cyprus had rigid constitutional changes which imposed a certain memory. I would feel bad. I would feel awkward. Right. Is there is there the possibility for soft memory law to start with? And uh, secondly, can't you see uh, a situation whereby the fact that there is a memory framework, let's not call it a law, but a memory framework would actually work uh, towards um, avoiding populist trends? Definitely. Yeah. This is where I agree. Yeah. A memory framework, a framework through which instead of putting the one against the other, we are joining in truth. We are joining in, in the construction of memory. We are acknowledging that our memory differs because different people have told us our memory, especially 
our kind of generation onwards, Stephanie, I'm not talking about our parents and, and whatever, this kind of framework would be a fantastic idea. Definitely. We, we, we found our common problem. <laughs> we found them. <laughs> but I have another very provocative question for Natalie and, and anyone else. When you talk about memory loss, whether they are soft or hard, uh, that is an What is the usual remit of memory loss? What about canon law? Can canon law be part of memory loss? I mean, look at the discussions of Cyprus in the past few days over those drawings by artists that are, you know, uh, uh, depicting uh, Christ in a very modern way. And if you read the reactions, you know, um, that makes you think that as if there was an, ent an entitlement to a specific sort of memory or specific sort of representation of Christ. So, are memory laws usually only historical? Can they also be uh, religious? Can they also be canon? Uh, or any other aspects? Nasia, uh, Nadia may be more suitable for this. I can't hear you. Sorry, my bad. Wait, okay. I, uh, I am not sure I understood the question correctly, I just want to say, but thank you for passing the ball. <laughs> <laughs> If you have nothing to say, you have nothing to say, but you know, I'm not an expert on memory law. And one thing that strikes me is uh, how everybody talks about memory, but we don't actually uh, define what is memory. So anyone can have a different understanding of memory. So obviously the church will have a different understanding of what is memory. Uh, citizens will have a different understanding and of course the governments will have a different understanding. So we may pass each other may cross each other and not be able to actually talk with each other. But I think this is what Natalie is saying, why freedom of expression and maintaining the discussion is, is such a major yes. necessity in such situations, right? But the question is whether there are, uh, what's the remit of memory loss? What's the scope of memory loss? Usually, are memory loss on uh, specific, uh, specific historical events or can they extend to uh, the rigid beliefs of a specific community. If you take, for example, an, an understanding culture of beings, uh, if this is considered memory law, how can we change that? Because freedom of expression cannot change that, I think. Yeah? yeah. Yes, but in, in talking, the freedom of, for example, let's take a vision, right? If you have fundamentalist Christians and fundamentalist Muslims that don't want to know about the, the belief of the other, obviously you create a lot of tension between the two. But if you have this freedom of expression, and I can say, you know, today I'm this month I am celebrating the Ramadan, and instead of putting a big X cancelling the other, but I actually initiate a discussion on what is the Ramadan, what is it needed, and so on, then you bring together the groups. It's more like what we do with social media issues. <laughs> Now I'm getting into it. But then we have to agree on what is the memory, what is the collective memory. Otherwise, you can't do that. Anyway, for me, I'm done. Okay. I have a relevant question. Uh -huh. though. It's a very legal one, but one of the, and I never had a chance to ask, uh, one of the aims of international criminal law is related to memory, right? in order to set straight a historical record and so on. Uh, so uh, what is the position of uh, memory law experts on the utility, let's say, of international criminal law, in that sense? Yeah, but isn't that mostly focused on the truth and reconciliation aspect? rather than denoting uh, and then deciphering from beforehand what the memory should be. I think that that's the yeah. yeah, I would say it could be, but the, what we know today from the aftermath of the former Yugoslavia cases, 
They have come, I mean, they are forming the memory of the generation that lived through the conflict, but they are forming the memory of the generation that is now, uh, I don't know, 15 years old and they have never been through the war, right? Yeah. So I, I, I think in the long run, there is a memory element to it. Definitely, and even on a on a local level. So, for example, in the ICPR in Rwanda, the importance of the Gazaka, which were essentially the place where the Tutsis and the Hutus would go together, and they would share the memory, and they would share the atrocity, and they would reconcile, like a kind of local truth and reconciliation court though that was very very heavily marked in the subsequent jurisprudence of the ictr but i would see that as very very different uh, to a law whereby victor orban and his party uh, are coming and imposing a memory which essentially ignores the atrocities committed by hungarians do you see what i mean that's what worries me and that's a differentiation i i would make and I wouldn't actually call the, the former a memory law as such. I would call it more of that truth and re reconciliation process, which again, as you recognize uh, completely effectively, is that that links to the construction of memory. It doesn't mean that we don't want to construct a memory. It doesn't mean that memory is not important, important for our identity. We just need to be very careful when someone else comes and imposes on what we should remember. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Natalie. And, thanks. Uh, thank you for joining us and thanks for uh, the incredible discussion.